This morning's text is uh, in 1 John, and we're going to be focusing in on verses 5 to 10 from the first chapter. But before that, I'd like to uh, give an introduction as to what we're doing this morning. So turn to 1 John in the first chapter. 1 John, along with his following epistles, 2nd and 3rd John, were written to the general church facing external and internal pressures. It was a very difficult time in the early church. There was the world at large who would bring persecution to the church, ultimately challenging believers to abandon their faith. It's identical to the very pressures the church at large faces today. There is nothing new under the sun. There were also many false teachers creating a lot of difficulty within the church. Many of the apostles by this stage had died, making John perhaps the last one left. But with him still alive, the church is now being challenged by a set of false beliefs that will eventually become known as Gnosticism. Gnosticism. Claiming the Spirit's guidance, this group had created a new Christology, one focused on the divinity of Christ while rejecting his humanity. Having a strictly dualistic worldview, they proclaim the spiritual as the epitome of good, and the physical as the epitome of bad. So even though Jesus may have appeared to be physical in their perspective, according to Gnosticism, he certainly was not. And we see a very anti-Gnostic strand in the first four verses of 1 John. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, so John testifies here to his apostolic authority as an eyewitness who Jesus personally taught. But he carries on, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the father and was made manifest to us. So according to John, an apostle of Jesus Christ, He certainly was physically with them. So these churches were struggling with what is essentially apostasy, the abandonment of the true Christian faith, and needed to identify who true Christians really were. Again, it's not unlike today. All three of John's epistles were written to encourage Christians to endure persecution and to strongly avoid and oppose the doctrines of false teachers, which John strongly calls antichrists. These epistles, they almost act as a spiritual defibrillator. They can serve to jolt the comfortable faith of modern Christianity back into the biblical rhythm of God's prescribed truth. And to our detriment, strongly avoiding and opposing false doctrines of the antichrists, while simultaneously having an unrelenting pursuit of biblical truth is not the desire of many professing Christians. It's understandably easier to focus on the parts of John's writings, such as John 3.16, or Jesus as the Good Shepherd from John 10, and the self-justifying God is love from 1 John 4.8. These have all been used to portray Christianity merely as a religion of charity and benevolence. However, we see a distinct irony in John's message for those wishing only to focus on the selected parts of God's nature. Of course, it is true that John is amazed by and proclaims God's love and the need for Christians all over to reflect this. But it's wrong to think that John is presenting God's benevolence, his love, his grace, as something everyone universally can or should ultimately enjoy. John's writing discriminates heavily in black and white, or should I say, in his words, light and dark. Those who are in the faith, who ultimately enjoy the love of God, and those who are not in this faith. John's desire is to focus on the breadth of God's character and how that relates to two categories of mankind, the repentant and the non-repentant. It was never ever John's intention to give a scattering of bumper sticker theology quotes to satisfy unrepentance and its persistent sin, but to hold up a plumb line of true Christian virtue. 
What's more, in John's view, true Christians, true Christian lifestyle is reflected in what we know, not by the extent of knowledge, but what is fundamentally known about God, if that is in fact true. And following the adage of by their fruits you will know them that we see in Matthew, John suggests that true believers will adhere to certain confessional statements and will live in accordance with the implications of those statements. So this produces the discussion in, in 1 John, which focuses heavily on obedience resulting from knowing what is true. Correct knowledge and actions are concurrent. They go hand in hand. And this is perhaps why John creates a distinct separation between his teaching and the teaching of his enemies. Those who align themselves with John's teaching, which is ultimately the Spirit's teaching, enjoy fellowship with God in Jesus, and this brings joy. Those who wish to enter into this fellowship must have unconditional acceptance of the testimony found in this epistle with no compromise. The reader must choose fellowship with John or fellowship with the world. The choice is black and white, night and day, dark and light, or the eternal implication, life and death. <clears throat> but now look down at verse 4 as we make our way to the primary text of today. Following John's bold and unrelenting exclusivism, also known as hate speech, <laughs> tongue in cheek, <clears throat> John has an abrupt change of tone. We now see a more hopeful and pastoral side of John showing. What could almost be mistaken, we could almost be mistaken that prior to this, John was talking to unbelievers, giving a clear ultimatum with no compromise. But he now holds to the hope that his audience are true believers and are indeed in fellowship with him. Throughout the epistle, John refers to his readership as my children and beloved or dear friends and brothers. Brothers is a term used throughout the New Testament to characterize the relationship between all Christians. So what is this testimony that John brings in which there can be no compromise? Let's now look at verse 5. <coughs> God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. What does the statement, God is light, mean? This has been a case of much contemplation for me. When we say God is love, we know what that means. We know what love is. When scripture says that God is spirit, well, we know what that is. God is not physical and therefore not bound by physical limitations. When we say God is just, well, we know what justice is. So there's little issue there. Same with God's patience, kindness, his wrath, etc. We know what these things are. But what does it mean when John says God is light? And we need to know this because it's foundational for the rest of John's epistle when referring to and understanding God's nature. So, there are numerous situations within the Old Testament when God would literally appear as light. In Exodus 13, we read how God went before the nation of Israel during their wanderings in the wilderness, as a cloud during the day, but by night, a pillar of fire to give them light. In Exodus 33 and 34, Moses asked God to show him his glory. <coughs> God told him, no man <coughs> can see him and live. <coughs> so Moses was put in the cleft of a rock and covered by the hand of God so that he would not die. But as Moses came down from the mountain, the text says that the skin of his face shone. Why? Because he had been talking with God, which literally enlightened his physical appearance. And this caused the people of Israel to become very afraid. <clears throat> Let's go forward to the New Testament, where we can think of the transfiguration, where Jesus took his disciples up a high mountain, where he would be transfigured, and they would have a visual experience of his true nature. Matthew 17 says of Christ that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. 1 Timothy 6.16 says 
that God alone has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light whom no one has ever seen or can see. God is also the source of our light. We can think of the very popular psalm, Psalm 27, where it says in the beginning, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And of course, Jesus Christ is called the light of the world, as he refers to himself in John chapter 8. But again, what exactly does that mean? We don't want to gloss over this as if it was merely just some abstract concept. Well, John, the same John that wrote 1 John, answers this for us in his gospel, the gospel of John. And it's interesting because chapter 1 of his gospel and his first epistle that we're looking at today share a lot of similarities. They parallel one another. 1 John says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, seen, etc., the life, that is Jesus, was made manifest, and this life, which was with the Father, was made manifest to us. Talking about the Son, the second person of the Trinity. And John, the Gospel, in this first chapter, also talks about Christ being in the beginning with God and being manifest to us. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 14, the Word became flesh. It also refers to him as life in verse 4 of his gospel. But it gives us something that clarifies what is meant by referring to God as light. Look at, if you're there, John chapter 1 verse 4. It says, in him was life and the life was the light of men. Life and light go hand in hand. So you could say that God is light because he is life. As light emanates from God, so does life. And we know that God is the source of all life because that is stated at the beginning of John's gospel. And also in Colossians chapter 1, it says that by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That's Colossians chapter 1. God is the source of all things and of all life. But for us as believers, he is the source of eternal life. Therefore, God is light to us through his son, Jesus Christ, who points us to the eternal life that is in his gospel. The two go hand in hand. God being true light means that he reveals to us what true life is. And that includes true knowledge and true moral purity and true holiness. Because if we go on in 1 John, it says, In him is no darkness at all. What is darkness? It is the opposite of light. Deception. Lies. Immorality. Sin. If God's light leads us to eternal life, Darkness ultimately leads us to eternal death. So, now that we have an understanding of light and darkness in this context, I'd like us to look deeper at the importance of walking in this light that John talks about. The topic of false teachers. Now, of course, false teachers are going to claim to have fellowship with God. And John acknowledges this within his writing. If we say... We have fellowship with him. False teachers always confess genuine faith. But we read the rest. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Remember, as previously stated, <coughs> in the context of what is written here, truth is not only believed, but it is inherently linked to what we do. The two are inseparable. So teaching lies is not doing the truth. So there are those who can claim to have fellowship with God, but they really don't because they're not actually teaching and therefore not doing what is true. They are not walking in the light, but in darkness. 
You cannot have true fellowship with God if what you believe about him are actually lies. Because in him is no darkness at all. <clears throat> therefore, those who claim to have fellowship with God but walk in darkness are therefore liars who cannot be true members of Christ's church. They cannot actually be Christians because they do not enjoy the same fellowship with God that true Christians do. It's the harsh truth. It's hard. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The only way to have true fellowship is to walk in the light, to be literally doing truth. True Christian fellowship results from us walking in the light, being and doing the truth. You know what this flies in the face of? Have you ever heard the slogan, doctrine divides? <laughs> I've heard this. From memory, I've never had it said to me, but I've certainly come up against its fruit. The mindset among many, unfortunately, where there is an allergic reaction to someone who confidently proclaims the Bible says. Shai Lin, who's a popular Christian rapper, says in one of his songs, today the only heresy is saying that there's heresy. Having an issue with a popular teacher because of what they teach uh, either doesn't align with or goes flat against clear biblical teaching is taboo. Oh no is the response. No, we don't get into that. Or in defense of a false teacher. And by false I mean those who teach heresy that goes fundamentally against who God is and who Jesus Christ is. I'm not talking about the secondary doctrines of which there can be differences amongst Christians, but we still have fellowship. But for the true heretics, the response often is, yeah, they have good things to say though. And of course, the one who desires to stand only on what is revealed in scripture is accused of being divisive and not willing to hear the message that's being presented or not grasping hold of the vision underlying the message. But according to John, it's the one who's not doing truth who is the one that is dividing from the saints. If our teaching is so erroneous that it does not match up to the light or the life, the word of Christ, we therefore cannot claim fellowship with the saints. Turn with me to Romans chapter 16. I'm going to look at verse 17. It says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles. So, he's giving us a warning here. But, let's read on. Avoid those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Or in John's language, they walk in darkness. For your obedience is known to all. Obedience being walking in the light or doing truth. So that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and what is, and what is good and innocent as to what is evil. So yes, we are to watch out for those who cause division in the church. But to think it's those who are fervent and wanting to stand on biblical truth has got it 180 degrees wrong. It's the one who teaches contrary to scripture that has already brought the division. And to follow them is to be complicit in such division. We have to, and I've underlined this, we have to have a correct understanding of true doctrine because the light in the life of God is correct doctrine. We need to strive to know who God is, who the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are, so that we can do truth. Being complacent is potentially divisive. Walking in the light is believing true, fundamental, foundational doctrine. It's being a fundamentalist. <laughs> we cannot separate our doctrine from our salvation. For John, knowing the truth, walking in the light, and being cleansed of your sins are not mutually exclusive. You cannot separate them from each other. 
thinking you can compartmentalize these things, that you can be a Christian that perhaps loves doctrine but avoids fellowship with a local body of believers or is a Christian but have no concern with correct doctrine or have no qualms accepting or joining in and even celebrating the moral depravity of this world is oxymoronic. Doing such is not having fellowship with the church, but with the world. It's flirting with darkness. Walking in the light leads us to true fellowship. And, as verse 7 ends, the blood of Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The rubber continues to meet the road. The gas cooker continues to heat up. It's a non-stop onslaught of check yourself, check yourself, check yourself. But it's so often the mention of sin. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It's this word where true convictions and beliefs of people bubble or even burst to the surface. And no amount of skilled speech can avoid the offence brought about from the tough subject of sin. If you want, turn to John chapter 8. We're going to look from verse 28. Jesus talking to a crowd. And he said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And as he was saying these things, many believed in him. So here, Jesus speaking has caused many of his listeners to believe. But what I have gathered from those much more learned in the original language than I is that John is not using the normative form of belief that he often uses. Belief when talking about true faith is present tense. That means it's something that's generally expressed or ongoing. It's consistent. A habitual practice. However, here John is using belief in the aorist tense. That's spelled A-O-R-I-S-T, aorist. Meaning that it's a belief without completion or continuation. It's a momentary whim, a response in the moment. So Jesus, continuing on in John uh, chapter 8, this is verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed, aorist tense him, if you abide or continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? So what happened here? Something switched. They believed, but now all of a sudden the thought of needing to be set free is repulsive to them. And if you read on in John chapter 8, they become so offended by Christ that they eventually pick up stones to stone him. The thought that one needs to be set free is offensive. And I'm sure many of us, if not all, have faced anger from an unbeliever when discussing the topic of sin and the need to repent. Perhaps we've been that angry sinner before, being angry at someone for mentioning to us the problem of sin before we finally bowed the knee to Christ. I've personally been on occasions with otherwise calm, level-headed persons where they have become visibly agitated and even furious at the thought that they're sinners that need to be set free. Many right now seem to be in a collective uproar. The proverbial stones are being hurled over the thought that the list in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10 could possibly be true. I remember one encounter in particular where I was talking about the things of God with an old friend from high school and it eventually came to the point where I brought up the issue of sin and the need to be saved from it. The hatred and the anger that then burst from an otherwise level-headed discussion was sudden. I'm a good person. I don't need saving. He had a lot more to say as well. It left me feeling I'd done something wrong or gone about it the wrong way. And it wasn't until some time later that I realized, no, 
If Jesus received the wrath of unbelief to the point where crowds wanted to stone him, what makes me think I would avoid the anger of self-righteousness? And he, Jesus got it from those who professed faith, who professed to believe in him as well. But sin is a hard pill to swallow. When properly understood, it's to admit the most grievous of faults at the core of our very being, which encompasses all that we are, spiritually, physically, everything. A depravity, a depravity that is then presented before a God who shares none of those faults. So we can't be surprised when encountering believers wanting to nullify the seriousness and effect of sin. We've all done it. Perhaps we, we still do it. We know or we don't even know that we nullify the effects of sin. But knowing that frustration and anger is somewhat inevitable, of course, does not give us the excuse to deliberately infuriate people or be recalcitrant in our behavior. The actions and the words of the apostles and, of course, Christ himself prohibits us from doing so. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 tells us to present the reasons for our faith with gentleness and respect. Romans chapter 12 says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. But it's naive to think we will never encounter the wrath of unbelief. A surface level reading of scripture, the history of the church, and of course what Christians face, not only in countries of persecution, but even in advanced, progressive, and tolerant societies would display such ideas. For those of us truly in the faith, however, it is not true that, is it not true for those of us who are in the faith that the more we learn about God in prayerful study of his word and listening to it being taught and proclaimed, that we recognize the ways in which we are not like him. And our reaction is to repent and to seek to abide in his word. To naturally carry out the arrowous tense of the verb believe. And to strive to become more like him is the action of Christians. It is to walk in the light because to do otherwise is deception. As verse 8 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. It's self-deception for anyone to think they have no sin. But also remember that John is writing with a focus to dispel Gnosticism. Again, that dualistic view that strictly categorizes the physical as evil and the spiritual as good. So this led them uh, concluding that one could continually and persistently sin in the physical, yet be spiritually sinless, because the, the physical and the spiritual are totally separate. So there are those who would say, I haven't sinned. My flesh sinned, but I haven't sinned. <laughs> Very convenient, yeah. And I think this mindset does exist to some extent today. I remember a Christian friend once telling me that our spirits are clean, it's our souls that are dirty. I thought it was a one-off and that he must have heard someone wrong. But no, I've heard others say it since. I had a teacher in Bible college passionately teach to the point where he actually got angry when people would disagree with him. But he taught that our spirits are saved through grace, but that our souls need to be saved through works to the point where our spirits can end up in heaven and our souls be doomed to hell. It was total nonsense. It literally did not make sense. Now, we may not able, be able to label these as strict Gnosticism, but it's the same error of creating these highfalutin categories that scripture does not allow for. In his challenge to the Gnostics, John was clearly refuting these unscriptural separations. Put it this way. John was saying, if you're a physical sinner, you are a spiritual sinner. If you are a sinner in any way, you are by nature, all encompassing through and through a sinner in every way. It affects every part of you. And I'm continually amazed at the fantastic ways we all invent to try and lessen the seriousness of sin. I think of those, those chalkboards, 
you see in the movies that are filled with mathematical equations and confusing symbols to discover the, I don't know, physical density of an atom colliding with how many neutrons or whatever, and someone's working this out, out mathematically. And in movies, these scenes can be used to describe someone who is obsessed, who is obsessed with discovering new mathematical truths to the point that they lose touch with reality. Trying to lessen the seriousness of sin is like a spiritual version of that. We can be guilty of constantly going to the, the metaphorical chalkboard and become obsessed with redefining sin. You think, well, we'll throw a bit of Gnosticism and modern day thinking in that. We think if we subcategorize the spirit from the actions taking place and subtract any possible relationship to the physical, thus treating them as unique entities, then divide that by one's intention and the fact that the cat just threw up its breakfast. No, we cannot do these things. We are sinners. We've got to stop deceiving ourselves. Sin originates with us, and it is our problem. The other way we deceive ourselves and lessen the seriousness of sin is we become accustomed to it. It becomes commonplace, and the next thing you know, excuses like, well, nobody's perfect, everybody makes mistakes, and everybody struggles with it come out. Now, of course, such statements are true. Nobody apart from Christ is perfect. But once again, we deceive ourselves to think that that makes sin any less deadly. The cross shows such statements to be totally vacuous. Why did Jesus need to die if sin really isn't so bad in certain circumstances? The cross shows us the more, sorry, the more we nullify the seriousness of sin, the more we move away from the truth and the light. The more we deny sin, what it is and the fact that we have it, the more we give testimony that the truth is not in us. But now notice in verse 9 of First John. Starting with the conditional clause, if, as it has done previously, as John did previously. If, meaning on the condition that. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice this. We are the ones confessing our sins. It is our problem. But the text immediately takes the spotlight from our wretchedness and focuses it on God's faithful and just nature and his willingness to make us clean. It does not say... We are sinners, and then keeps the spotlight on us by then saying, but God has made a way for us to make it right. No. Faithful and just is he to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Salvation is the work of God alone. This is never something we do or contribute to ourselves. It is purely 100% done for us, not because of who we are, but because of who Christ is. And remember that repentance is not a one-off, but a continual practice of the Christian life. Verse 7 says, If we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we walk, it's a continual thing. It's an ongoing practice. Think of the Lord's Prayer. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. That prayer, it's a, it's a daily prayer to ask repentance. as a daily action, a continual action. Once we're saved, we're saved for good, and we all persevere in that. That's true. But this is done through a life of repentance as a continuing practice until that day when Christ consummates the work he has done, makes full and complete the work of his life, death, and resurrection. It makes us fully good again. Let's go on to verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Again, this is where John is continuing to refute that Gnostic belief that someone can sin in the flesh, but they're really not sinners as such, because spiritually, the part of them that is not dependent on the physical is pure. And again, that chalkboard, 
<laughs> but John clearly stated, if we say we have not sinned, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Once again, there is no room for these, these weird, sinfully created categories. The dreadful result of such claim, as I touched on before, is that God is, and as it says in the text, God is made out to be a liar. How so? If we claim we have no sin, we make the cross unnecessary, regardless of circumstance. If we subscribe to this idea that man is basically good, we're calling God a liar. We're saying he lied in the necessity of the cross. That the amazing act performed by the Trinity, the Son being willingly sent by the Father to do the work of redemption, and then send the Spirit to help us in the outworking of that, is unnecessary. To look upon the greatest act of love that will ever be undertaken, the cross where Jesus bled and died, taking our punishment upon himself, and to think that it's too drastic is to call God a liar. And it shows that his word is not in us. The first rung of Christianity is acknowledging our sin problem before a holy and righteous God. To compromise on this in any way is to compromise the gospel, the Christian faith, the work of Christ at its very foundation. Furthermore, John eliminates any thought that someone can be a Christian by giving mere mental assent to God, be it through cultural tradition, traditions or family traditions or otherwise. One cannot have a mere intellectual conviction that God is real, merely through argumentation. Has anyone here heard of the Kalam cosmological argument? Okay. You probably have, just it's got that weird title. It can be summed up in what is called a syllogism, or something that arrives at a conclusion based on two or more assertions that are agreed to be true. So, for example, this is how the argument goes. One... Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Everyone agrees. Two, the universe began to exist. Everyone agrees. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. That's how the argument goes. Right? And, of course, we'll call this cause God. There are arguments like this uh, that one can use to reason and evidence to point to the fact that God exists, or should I say a God exists. They're right. They work. They're true. But where they fail is they only present bare theism. They do not point one towards the God of Scripture, his holiness, our sinfulness, and the need for reconciliation that was completed through Jesus Christ. I heard this testimony just last week, and I thought it would be perfect to fit in here. This is how it goes. It's just very small. I used to be an atheist, and have finally, finally found a church. In terms of my own faith, I decided to become a Christian just over two years ago, after a period of about three years in which I had rejected my teenage atheism. I never thought anything would shake me from it, but an explanation of the Kalam cosmological argument by my old politics teacher, he also taught philosophy and is a Muslim, did exactly that. I came home from school and realized that I could no longer be an atheist because the alternative seemed far more convincing to me. For me, it had to be intellectually and historically convincing, for I was not going to come to faith from a heart perspective. It was always the head for me, and the latter came later. I became more aware of our values as a civilization, and I've since become convinced of how much we owe to Christianity and how much we lose by ditching it. Now, I hope that there is more to this person's faith than what was in this brief testimony. There needs to be a confession of sin before a holy God in faith in Christ, not merely a stance that belief in God is most likely to be true uh, compared to no belief and that we need it for a functioning society. Giving mere mental assent to God is not synonymous with walking in the light. The other fundamental issue with these arguments is they assume they, they, they don't realize the sin problem from the get-go. They assume that we can talk to someone 
on level playing ground. That we're, 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 we've got this level ground where someone could believe in God or they could not believe in God. We just need to present the evidence for them. Right? But Scripture clearly teaches that we have a sin problem. And through that sin, we suppress what is obvious in unrighteousness. No one needs evidence that God exists. They need to be confronted with their sin in light of the God they know exists. Uh, it says this in Romans chapter 1, that uh, the existence of God is evident. But in our sinfulness, we suppress it in unrighteousness. That's the problem. The problem isn't that someone doesn't have enough evidence. The problem is sin. Furthermore, uh, John eliminates cheap grace. So what is that? What is cheap grace? Cheap grace is a term uh, coined by theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You may have heard of him. He lived in Germany during World War II. He was, in fact, part of a failed uh, plan to assassinate Adolf Hitler. Um, anyway, it's fascinating. I think his book is available somewhere in the library. Uh, it's called The Cost of Discipleship. <laughs> Bonhoeffer coins cheap grace as the grace we bestow on ourselves. <laughs> Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cost, grace without knowing Jesus Christ, living and incarnate. This can also be called carnal Christianity. You may have heard that, in which someone can be a Christian but continue to sin um, habitually. But of course, Scripture is ignorant of this, meaning that there is no such thing. Christianity is the realization that one needs to abandon one life, a life of sin and death, of darkness, uh, repent before God and pursue a life in an opposite direction, one of truth and one of life. There is no such thing as carnal Christianity. To believe so is to separate Christ's salvific work from the fact that that he is Lord. And we need to acknowledge him as Lord. Because if we don't acknowledge him as Lord, then who are we repenting to? The fact that he is Lord shows that we need to repent to him. The two cannot be separated. So when 1 John 1.7 says, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, this assumes that there is need of such cleansing. And so verse 8 of 1 John says, if we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So, a warning is that we cannot join the myriads, the many modern-day professing believers that are progressively denying what sin actually is. And this is happening at an alarming rate right now in society. Happy to accept and even promote immorality. Watch it as entertainment. Or openly defend others who practice such sins. Jesus Christ came and died for such practices. Let us free from, flee from them and run to the light. Stand in the truth and have life. Following, following what we read from the Apostle Paul in Romans 16 earlier about false doctrine causing divisions, he further stated, I want you to be wise as to what is good, and innocent as to what is evil. That's Romans 16. May we walk in the light and be sensitive not to walk in darkness. May we desire to take up our cross and follow Christ, to cast off the desires and temptations of the world. May we stay true to God's unchanging truths, refusing to bow to culture's ever-changing moral standards. As tempting as they may be, such things, these things of culture, will soon perish. Death is their end. But for us who confess our sins and walk in the light, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in him we shall have no end. As a way of end, I'd like us to read again from 1 John, but chapter 2, 
verses 24 and 25. Throughout his epistle, John completely rolls around on this, on this theme that we've been talking about this morning, the separation of light and dark and, and the need to check ourselves and to continually walk in the light and make sure that our professed faith is indeed genuine. And he says again um, in this theme, in this verse, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. Let us pray. Lord God, the first act of calling is by your command. In your word, come to me, return to me. The second is to let in light so that we see that we are called and understand the sweetness of your command as well as its truth in regard to your great love of the sinner. As vile as we are, you invite us to come and have true fellowship with you. Therefore, Lord, we don't need to search to see if we are elect or loved. For if we turn, you will come. Christ has promised fellowship if we take him, and the Spirit will pour himself out on us, abolishing sin and punishment, assuring us of strength to persevere. It is your pleasure to help all that pray for grace and come to you for it. When our hearts are sick with sin, sorrow, darkness, and death, only your free grace can help us act under the true knowledge, uh, under the knowledge of unworthiness. Will us to come to you daily and lament for being enticed by some other task, be it pleasing to the heart or even seem reasonable. Let us not overlook whom all creation is accountable. And do not let us forget the judgment that fell on Christ, who was made accountable for us, and draw us to him. Amen.